six, 16, 11, we have one, two, three very defined lines and three very defined peaks in the spectra. Seven is a bit of a dud. Um, it, uh, it's an 8.06, it doesn't have uh, anything close to a second uh, peak that's on the double and therefore it doesn't have a nice second line and that seems to be the pattern. Another 8.06 and this one has one, two, three lines. Nine is a beautiful one at 7.81. One, two, three lines, very defined. Uh, 10 and 11, 12 qualified to make this cut by amplitude, but, but they're kind of duds relatively. 13, 7.81, second line starting to come in. 14 has a second line, and so does 15 if I remember, yep, okay. So if we could take a look at the summary, we had about eight bursts at 8.06, Seven of them showed harmonics. Six bursts at 7.81. Half of them showed harmonics. Remember there was this one at 8.3, which kind of surprised me, and that had the makings of a harmonic. And then just to be complete, I looked at three or four that would have made the cut on amplitude, um, uh, but they were too high. So I looked at them not expecting to see anything. That was not my expectation, but I did see one at 8.79, that showed those three lines of harmonics. And then I started taking snapshots at other sessions, and there was also one at 7.4, which surprised me. So that, that really killed my initial idea that these harmonics are only going to happen at eight hertz. So it seems that Bill is more of an independent variable than I guessed. He can do these harmonics throughout a wide range of frequency. He just tends to do them around eight hertz for reasons we could speculate. Now if we take a look at the whole uh, 15 samples, good and bad, and look at the spectra, we get three peaks. This one, 7.81, just barely edges out 8.06. The double is slightly above double 7.81, and the triple is triple 7.81. And if we magnify that third peak, it is fairly well defined. And now the big drum roll for me was what about the person in the other room with a cap of electrodes on them? Uh, I had done some kind of sneak peeking, kind of quick and dirty measurements, and I thought, I'm going to see a nice peak at 8 hertz. And now, but now I've really got the goods. I've got exactly the data that I want to see. I want to apply that data through Excel and pick these data points and see what I get over there. And when I did that, I was very disappointed to see this. And it's pretty undifferentiated. It comes, the, it just kind of this big sweep of theta, and it drags along. Here's 8 hertz right about here. So I was disappointed and I called Jay on the phone and I told him what happened and he said, well, keep in mind, there can be a delay between uh, resonator, resonate E, whatever the right terminology is. <laughs> so he says that you're most likely to find uh, some kind of a frequency match on your biggest, strongest sample. So I took a look at number six here, that's our longest strong sample. And Bill had an 8.06 there. And sure enough, there is an 8.06 peak. It's not nearly as dramatic as Bill's would be. And if we take a closer look, here it is right here. It's got a little needle top. It's much higher than what goes before it. That theta sweep is reduced, but uh, that's what it is. And, and so perhaps, perhaps they're sharing this, this peak here, and that's Bill's influence. Uh, the other two big samples did not uh, share a peak, did not, have a, did not share a peak with Bill's sample. But given that uh, this delay idea, I took a look at the end of sample number two, and the subject did have big waves right at the end of sample two. So I think that if this sample was slightly redefined, we'd have two out of three matches. And I took a look at this number nine here, and no matter what you do with that, that's not going to be a match. That's just, that's just not gonna work. So even, even if you believe they are sharing a peak, I think you also have to believe that no matter how good a signal uh, Bill might send, it would have the ability to be blocked, stopped, not received, however that should be said. Um, and I think I'll end with uh, taking a look at an image of, of Bill's full, all of these 15 on the bispectra. 
And uh, that's the end of my talk. That's as far as I've gotten. Well, when I, when I looked at it, uh, when I looked into it a little bit, and, and, uh, and Jay was looking into it a little bit as well, or talking about it with me, it seems to have a, a good amount of variance. Uh, I think according to the government agency, there's about a 0.3 hertz standard deviation per day or so. So you can see they have little, little dots of, of ranges, and it, it, it does range uh, a good deal. So, because it's based on the weather, so you'd expect it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, what I would love to know is where you, I would love to know for another time is what, what was the frequency at that time on that day, but I didn't anticipate this, so I don't know. You're a researcher. You're supposed to anticipate everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. From your uh, description, I've seen you use the Fourier uh, transform. Yeah. And you did it in Excel? No. No, it, it, it's a software called WinEEG. It's just that. You did some windowing then too? Yeah. The, the Fourier is windowed, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's sort of on the borderline of you know, having artifacts because of the you know, short period. I mean, have you ever thought about using wavelets or something that's more. That's, that's kind of the next step. Cause because there are this is little episodic bursts, and uh, I, I don't think we're using the perfect tool for this. Okay, next question. Hi, with great presentation. You did a great job with that short period of time. Um, what did you do? You have information about the individual key leaves that might also, I mean, something other than the, the numbers that they have information about them personally. Well, not just where they cure, but what were their individual characteristics, either personality-wise or physically or emotionally or whatever? They, they, were, they were simply people who were uh, silly enough to volunteer to fly to Phoenix and do this. Uh, and some were SSC members. Uh, so they, they, weren't, they weren't patients per se. They were just volunteers to be wired up in another room. Do you ever take personal data from the, the clients or the PLEs when you, you do some of these? No. And you might want to. I, I find when I've worked with healers in studies, there's a lot of very, very valuable data that might help to explain some of the reason you're not getting these for you to for it. You might be able to stress the correlation. Okay, thank you. Dave? Uh, look, uh, I uh, used TM for about four years to uh, overcome uh, work-life stress. And only one time, I, I practiced twice a day and you're supposed to. And it really did help. But only one time, I, I came, I was really far out. I didn't, wasn't even conscious of where I was. But I came back and my whole body went, whoa, 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 and settled down. Any thoughts as to what that might be? Do I know what that might be? <laughs> It's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Look, I the presentation. Is there any correlation to the 7.8183 to the depth or the length of the healing and for what extent? I know that you're in the beginning of that, but I'm just wondering about if there's a correlation between that frequency and how much. Yeah. That's I, I just feel like I'm at the beginning of the beginning. I, I really couldn't answer that. That's, there's so many good questions. Yes. Uh, it was a great presentation, I think, but it raises a couple of questions for me. One, one is, um, how do you determine cause from effect? You know, was the healer causing this, or was he being affected by the shooting residents? Yeah. And my second part, the B part of that question is, um, how do you know the healing, the function going on in his head, what he's calling healing, is 
nothing else other than concentration like someone